idea is just to go over some tips and troubleshooting and methods for quantitative, regular old, Western or immunoblotting, whichever you like to call it, for qualitative and quantitative immunoblotting, and then I'm going to add some tactics that we're taking on multiplexing. And for photosynthetic organisms, we don't limit ourselves to plants. In fact, my own research is on cyanobacteria, the picocyanobacteria. The goal of this workshop is that you and your group of students can generate clear and publishable, I'd like to say uh, quantitative as well, immunoblots. Okay, so that's what we're going to work on today. This uh, first image that I throw up here is uh, a blot that was run by a third year undergraduate student, so like a 19 year old kid, in um, the course that I teach at Mount Allison University. So one of the courses I teach is in molecular biology and we do quantitative immunoblotting as one of the units. So this student has treated some uh, Sinecococcus elongatus, some cyanobacteria with high light and low light and she's doing a quantitative immunoblot for PSBA or the D1 protein of photosystem 2. This is the first blot she's ever run. This is another one, the first blot from a, an honor student of mine. So this student is in fourth year, she's now 20 and she is the first quantitative western blot that she ran looking at the beta subunit of ATP synthase also in uh, cyanobacteria, in this case it's cystis. So the goal here, nice clean backgrounds with nothing in them, nice bands, good standard range that encompasses our sample. So this is kind of the overview of the talk that I'm going to give. These are the points to consider when you're planning an immunoblotting or western blotting experiment. You've got to get your sample harvested carefully. It's probably the most important part of the whole thing. We'll go over that in detail. Uh, you've got to get all of the protein out in a consistent, reproducible way from your samples. This is also key uh, if you want to compare like treatment and a control. If you're not getting the same extraction efficiency from those two treatments, you're, you can't compare anything. So that's incredibly important. If you want to do quantitative immunoblots, you've got to have quantitation standards. And I'll, I'll give you some tips on how to do quantitative immunoblotting if you don't have standards, but you've got to have something to compare. It's important to have consistent electrophoretic separation, and I have some methods that I use because I have the most inconsistent people in the world doing all of my research for me. Um, <clears throat> you've got to transfer absolutely everything from the gel to a membrane because if you don't transfer it quantitatively, then you could introduce a lot of error there in terms of quantitation. You also can't transfer it right through. That happens with small proteins quite frequently. You've got to get the right antibody dilution. You've got to have more actual molecules of antibody than you do have target proteins on the blot. So it's important to consider that when you're doing your Western. You have to select your detective reagents carefully. We'll talk about a few different possibilities. You can do chemiluminescent, fluorescent, but you have to make sure that the dynamic range and the product is linear in its signal. Sensitive image capture is really important if you want to do quantitative immunoblotting. It's not so important if you're just going to do pretty pictures for a paper, but if you want to do quantitative work, you've got to have a good image capture system with a nice interface, um, and that will lead to the meaningful quantitation that you can get. So let's jump into that then. Let's start with sample harvesting. Um, I picked the ultimately Canadian maple leaf there as a photosynthetic Canadian example. Thought I was quite clever, but anyway. Um, here, speed is of the essence. The minute that you pick that sucker or spin them down if you're working on algae, um, you've got to stop every quickly. So you should immediately freeze things in liquid nitrogen and then store at minus 80 to prevent any kind of degradation or change in your sample. Um, often with leaf tissue, we will put a piece of tin foil on the balance, put the, the sample on, weigh it, immediately fold it up and throw it in the liquid nitrogen. And the tape that you marked it with will immediately fall off and you will not know what you have. So you have to come up with a system to get that sucker tightly labeled um, before you put it in the freezer. Long-term storage can lead to degradation. So don't store your samples at minus 20. Um, store your samples at minus 80 or lower. So be careful. If you are fortunate enough to work on phytoplankton, um, there's different methods you can use. You can filter them onto glass fiber filters without binder. 
and freeze the filters, or you can spin them down and freeze the, the pellet. That works quite well. All right, now you've got a chunk of frozen green goop, and now we're at the same place, because as soon as you melt that leaf tissue, it's gonna look like green glop anyway. Um, you've gotta do some of the protein out of the tissue. It starts, for you plant-type people, by grinding the tissue in liquid nitrogen. So what I would typically do, we have this um, styrofoam, it's, a, it's the lid of a styrofoam cooler that we got something you know, shipped in, that we've curved out a bowl shape. We place the, the what's the bowl, is that the pestle? The, that's the mortar, right? No? Yeah, I never get that right. <laughs> the bowl bit uh, sits there, you pour liquid nitrogen into it until it stops off-gassing immediately. So it gets really cold with the other bit, that's the pestle. I have trouble with that. Sitting in there, so everything gets super cold. Then you put your frozen piece of tissue in there and give a grind, adding liquid nitrogen as necessary. You don't want it to melt, okay? So you're just grinding. You're not, you haven't added anything to it. Just grinding it to break the tissue apart. Scoop that mess into a tube, and then you have a few options. What we have done in the past is to use a probe sonicator at about 30% amplitude, and what we do is we take that leaf powdery frozen tissue, we add a solubilization buffer to it. Your choice of solubilization buffer can be anything you like. What I like is a, an LDS, so lithium dodecyl sulfate, instead of sodium, it's, it's much more soluble, based extraction buffer that has buffering agents in it, glycerol for heaviness, of course, when you run the gel, and some protease inhibitors. So I typically use PEFABLOCK, you can also use the Sigma, protease inhibitor cocktail, and there's others on the market, but you should have some kind of protease inhibitor in there to stop breakdown. So if you add some of this uh, solubilization buffer to your tube, and then you snap freeze it vertically in liquid nitrogen, you end up with a tube, green gunk, and your solubilization buffer, all frozen, super hard, solid. And then what I do is I take it and um, put that in the probe sonicator and sonicate it just until it thaws. And the deal here is you absolutely don't want the mixture to heat up. So you don't want it warm. So you take it to sort of green slushy stage. And if you start to get bubbles, absolutely stop. And then, depending on the tissue type, I would redo that, freeze in liquid nitrogen and re-sonicate two to three times. And I can't tell you how long it takes to sonicate. It depends on the volume of sample buffer that you use. It depends on the power of your sonicator probe and how new it is and a lot of different things. But just take it just until it thaws. There are other ways of doing this if you have the money. We 10, no, eight years ago, tested out a bunch of these bead beaters and found that they did not work well at all. But recently there are some new ones on the market. The two that I have purchased are the Fast Prep here, we own this one, and the Preselis. Although if you get the Preselis, make sure you get the um, cold temperature adapter that puts liquid nitrogen into the unit to keep it cold. With the fast prep, you can actually freeze the, the rack that holds the tubes so that they go in there frozen or, or very close to it. What these guys do is they use beads in a tube to smash apart the cells. Bonus here is you don't have to go through the liquid nitrogen grinding phase. So you can actually just put a leaf in there or a cell pellet or whatnot. And you can get really the nice thing here is you can get super consistent extraction across a, a number of samples. So I could put 24 cell pellets in there and they would get exactly the same treatment in the fast prep or the pre-cellies, okay? There are some caveats though. Every time my students start on a new species and we're working on the picocyanobacteria, their lab rat cyanobacteria and diatoms, so quite a number of very diverse organisms, every new species I have them optimized for the fast prep. So that means that they, um, they'll take a sample and they'll put it in the tube, they'll put a good volume of extraction buffer, say something like 350 or 400 microliters, and they do one cycle, which t tends to be about a minute on the fast prep. They do a cycle, they spin the tube, they take an aliquot and put it aside, maybe 50 microliters, and then they do that whole process five times. And what I have them do then is take the extract and do protein assays on it. And what I'm looking for is to see whether the protein extracted is increasing with each cycle. And usually what happens is it gets to a plateau and no more comes out on the cycles. And then I have them load a constant amount of protein 
onto a gel and run a Western blot on it to look at whether any of the proteins are degrading. Because ultimately, it's a balance between complete extraction and then you start to degrade with too much abuse. Every species we've looked at so far has been either two or three cycles of the fast prep. So that'll give you a ballpark of what you need. Those have all been on phytoplankton. Um, so you've got to test it out and make sure you're getting complete extraction. But the nice thing is that every single one of your samples will be treated exactly the same, no subjectivity. And so that, that makes a, a big help. And it takes five minutes to do the extraction of 24 samples. It's going to take you the better part of a day to sonicate them three times. So this really speeds things up hugely. All right, now you have green glop in a tube. If you've spun down any insoluble material, if you're working on plants, you're always going to have some snare to get, get out of the way, maybe a little bit of lipid if you're working on seeds. If you are working on seeds, you might think of increasing the concentration of your solubilization buffer. Maybe use 2x rather than 1x. That'll help deal with the excess oil or fat that's in those samples. Then you have to separate on a gel. Now, there's different ways to load samples when you're going to put them on a gel. You can load on leaf area, on wet weight, on my favorite is micrograms total cell protein, on chlorophyll content. Some of those things change with treatment, so you have to be very careful to keep all that information um, consistent. But what we generally do is once we've extracted, we use a protein assay. My favorite is the BioRad DC assay. It's detergent compatible, so it can deal with the LDS or the SDS that you have there. And then we, and, and that's why we have a clear solubilization buffer. It's not blue at this point, so that it doesn't interfere with that assay. And then I will load a consistent number of micrograms of total cell protein onto the blot. Typically, I start with one microgram loads of total cell protein, 0.5 to 2.5 if you want to do quantitative blots. If you would like beautiful pictures for a paper, you might want to bump them up the load to more like five micrograms. That will depend on your detection system as well. But um, you can experiment with that. If you want to be quantitative, it's important to keep the, the load small, OK? Um, so then you have to separate on your gel. There's a lot of gels out there. There's more and more all the time. If you guys actually have to pour your own, I feel sorry for you. But um, when you're working with undergraduates, my favorite, the one I've found is the most consistent, is the, the Invitrogen New Page Bistris gel. And by the way, don't get a cut from Invitrogen for this. I have tried, but they won't give me money. Anyway, but they, they do uh, make amazing gels. They last a long time. They keep for a year in the fridge. And most important to me, an undergraduate student can run it and generate a proper gel and a proper blot. Um, generally speaking, you have two choices for your running buffer, a mess or a mops. Mess, basically, for proteins under about 55 kilodaltons, mops for bigger ones. And I run them 200 volts from anywhere between 25 and 55 minutes, depending on the, uh, depending on the size of the protein. Nice tip, do put your, make up your buffer the night before and put it in the fridge. You'll get much tighter, nicer bands if the running buffer's cold and uh, keeps things from diffusing. So I said small loads when you're doing um, quantitative blots. Okay, then you have to take that protein in the gel and transfer to a membrane. Um, there's a lot of different products also on the market these days for transfer. I personally like the wet transfer from in vitro. Uh, it still doesn't take that long. It's between 60 and 80 minutes. And I find it to be much more quantitative than the dry transfers. We actually own an eye blot from in vitro. And what I find happens there is some of the proteins zip right through the membrane and some of them are left behind the gel. This is not good. So whatever you do, Make sure that you've loaded colored markers on your gel, pre-stained, so that you can see the migration, but also so that you can see when you transfer whether everything came out and whether any of it went right through. Um, nitrocellulose membranes are fine for hydrophilic proteins. If you're working on phobics, make sure to use PVDF. It has a much higher binding capacity for hydrophobic proteins. If you're going to do multiplexing and fluorescent blots, make sure to use a low fluorescence PVDF. PVDF just lights up like a Christmas tree on its own um, in the fluorescent detection. Also, uh, talking about markers for a second, uh, I insist that all of my students load a pre-stain. Lots of choices out there. Precision Plus, BioRad's 
product works nicely. My favorite is the Novex Sharp because it has lots of different colors and there's one right down to three kilodaltons and then some really high molecular weight stuff. But what I do is I mix a little bit of um, uh, tagged marker in with it so I can see it on the, it, on the developed blot. So I, I know what size I'm looking at every time because it's really easy to fool yourself into thinking that your band is a different size than it is. And if you have something that actually is detected when you do your, um, de whatever detection system you're using, you're absolutely sure that you know what you're looking at. So I just use about a three to five microliter of the color with about a half a microliter of the tag. I use Magic Marks XP, that's an in vitrogen product as well. You've run it gel, you've transferred it, you're on the membrane. Uh, now you have to detect your antibodies, where, where they are. Um, a key here when you're, when you're doing your antibody incubations is to make sure that you are in a molar excess, like I said, of antibody over target protein. It's very important. You add up all the target protein standards, all the lanes put together. You've got to have more molecules of antibody in there than that. Um, so make sure you're in an excess. What else on that front? Lots of antibody choices here. The catalog you have from Agrocera, there's a lot of things to choose from. But make sure you keep, keep the amounts um, in a good state. All right, once you have got anti, oh, I was gonna talk about blocking. That's what I was gonna talk about there. You must block carefully. You can use regular milk, carnation milk powder, that works. We use the one that comes with uh, East Vance, their blocking agent. If you're doing fluorescence, a lot of the companies recommend C-Block. In our hands, it doesn't work. We use the ECL Advanced Blocking Agent even when we're doing uh, fluorescent antibody detections because we find the C-Block washes out all of our signal as well as all the background. So uh, it's important to have, to check out your blocking conditions from time to time. For um, chemiluminescent detections, I, my favorite product is ECL Advance, although there are lots of cheaper ECLs out there. Um, you'll just have to make sure that your range of, for your loads and your antibody dilutions match the detection system that you're using. If you're using regular ECL, you might need to load more protein, you might need to use more antibody. One of the nice things about ECL Advance is that you don't need much antibody. For a pretty picture, I tend to use one in 50,000 dilution, one in 25,000, sometimes as high as one in 10,000, but you don't need much. Um, and um, you need some kind of way of capturing the image. You can do this on x-ray film, works just fine. It's a little harder to, but you can scan the film and use image J or something like that to quantitate. The best thing to do is to have an image or capture the data. Uh, for chemiluminescence, a cooled camera can be important because you get a lot of background if your camera's not cooled. So something to look at if you're buying one. Um, many of the imagers will also allow you to do fluor detection. So you can do Q, uh, Q dots, quantum dots, or dye lights, or alexifluors. And these um, are really nice because you can do multiplexing with them. Uh, they are also supposed to have a larger dynamic range than ECL. ECL tends to be nonlinear. You can see a band that has very little protein there. And then you get this sort of pseudo linear range and then it tops out and you just don't see any more at the end. You've got to be in the linear range if you want to take. Problem is you can still see this stuff when there's very little present. The Q dots and the dilates are supposed to have a larger dynamic range. There is a, there is a catch though. You've got to use them at about one in a thousand dilutions. So you chew through them. So how do you go about taking a blot that you've got a lovely picture of now and you want to know exactly how much protein are in those samples. So you have to do quantitation with it. This is sort of the old system that we used to use. We have shifted our, uh, our quantitation software recently. This is with quantity one from the, that comes with the BioRad imagers. So basically the first step is to blow it up, zoom in so that you can see your bands. They look a little pixelated. There's a thing with imagers. You can either get sensitivity or you can get um, pretty pictures. Okay, so it's either about um, getting a really fine, no pixelation versus sensitivity. Uh, we go for sensitivity, which means we're quite pixelated images. If you're having trouble on your imager getting the level of detection or sensitivity, sensitivity versus resolution. Um, 
the resolution is poor on these, sensitivity is good. If you're having problems with your sensitivities on your imager, go in and find the binning function. Ramp it up to like four by four binning and you will get a much more sensitive uh, capture. Because what that's basically doing is taking a ton of pixels and putting them together and counting them as one great honky big fat pixel rather than a whole pile of little ones and it will be more sensitive. So you zoom in on the image and then you use some kind of contour drawer to go right around the, um, the bands. Now there's a problem here. The imager is comparing the bit inside the contour with the stuff around it. And there's two ways to deal with that, what we call the background. You can do it locally or globally. Most um, imagers will give you a choice of local or global background subtract. And what they are is, the, the easiest one to understand is a background subtract. What I would do here is go and select an area of the background. This is a great blot for doing global background subtract because basically I have no background here. So I just select an area and what it does is it calculates the average pixel density of number of counts in that area and applies that to all the spots, okay? Depending on how many pixels are inside the contour, it'll say, okay, you've got 500 pixels in there, I'm gonna apply my background to all of them, and that's global subtraction. If your blots don't look quite as pretty as this, you may have to do a local background subtract. And what that does is the, the row of pixels just outside of my contour, like the blue line there, it takes the intensity or the counts in those pixels, averages them, and applies that across the whole area inside. So it says, well, it's kind of messy there, we'll, we'll take that, that, that local background and apply that to your samples. It can be a good thing and a bad thing. You may have to do it if you have a blotchy or less clean blot. But if blotchiness comes up, it can also reduce the signal. If you've got a, like a dark patch around one of your bands, it's gonna subtract that darkness from your signal and make it seem less than it is. It's tricky. The background subtract is a, a tricky part of this. Then you can get the number of adjusted volume or counts from within each of your standards, use that to plot a standard curve and calculate, once you've done the contours around all of your samples, exactly how many picomoles, femtomoles, whatever range you're working in, you have in your band in question. This one is nicely linear, although it's probably due to this, but I would just use a linear regression. Every time we do one of these now, I insist the students plot it in Excel, don't listen to what the program tells you, and look at the line, And because you sometimes have to use a polynomial instead of a linear regression through them. Polynomials can be fantastic for giving you a, a tight fit, but never, ever, ever go outside the range of your standards with a polynomial, because polynomials do stupid things, like they curve back on themselves, or flying through the roof. So you've just got to stick to your standard range if you're going to use a polynomial plot. So, in this way, we can load a certain number of micrograms of total cell protein or wet weight or leaf area on each lane and then determine how many femtomoles or picomoles of a certain protein we have. Let's say you didn't have the luxury of working on one of the 10 or 12 that we have calibrated protein standards for. What are you gonna do then? All you can really do, and unless you've got unlimited resources, you can clone, overexpress, and quantitate yourself, but if you don't, what you do is you pick a sample of which you have a lot, and you load, say, a quarter as much, as much normal load and twice as much, all right, on every blot. Standard curves have to go on every blot. Every blot is different. And then you plot those in terms of a fold amount versus their intensity. Don't fool yourself ever into thinking that if the, if the number of counts in a band is twice, another band that there's twice as much protein there. These things don't have a slope of one. It, it really, I had to actually do the experiment multiple times to convince myself of that. So a single standard that you put on all your blots, it's not really telling you anything. It's a one point standard curve. It doesn't really mean a whole lot. Even if you just do two or three, at least you've got a real slope there that you can use to, to calculate fold changes. So if you wanna use fold changes, it's quite possible but make sure you have a uh, standard on your blot. So, to take this another step further, what if you wanted to look at two proteins at a time? 
There's a number of reasons you might want to do this. In this particular example, I can't see the red particularly well. I've got some better images coming. You, for instance, we wanted to compare the levels of the D1 and the D2 protein of photosystem 2 in diatoms under high and low CO2 conditions. And um, so you could actually do this on the same blot. Why would you want to do that? Well, your loads are absolutely consistent. So there's no question but that the amount of protein in the lane is exactly the same for the other one because it's the same protein in the same lane at the same time. So multiplexing can allow you to look at multiple proteins in exactly the same sample at the same time. What we've done here is we've looked at uh, PSBD and PSBA at the same time. And here what we've done is we've used one chicken and one rabbit antibody and used a different um, labeled secondary. I used an anti-rabbit with uh, 550 and, uh, no, anti-rabbit with 550, that's the green, and anti-chicken with the 488, that's the red. But um, what we're working on now is making a number of our uh, most popular antibodies pre-labeled. That's where the real fun begins because then all you have to do is put on labeled primary, maybe two or three of them at a time, image, and you're done. So you save many hours off of your experiment, time is money, at least in the business world, and um, you, you don't get effects of differential secondary binding and whatnot. So this can be, this can be a very powerful thing. I was kind of farting around, I say I, I mean, I, I told Natalie, to um, load the standard curves in opposite directions just for effect, and it turns out that loading one on top of the other makes that really obnoxious blip in the middle of one of the lanes. But um, it, it, it's nice because these two proteins are almost the same size, so I was hoping that it would, we'd be able to see the difference. Here's another one that we did where we did Rubisco, RBCL, at the same time as PSBA, and um, the red is PSBA, the green is RBCL, and um, actually my samples are out of range here. I could not use this blot for quantitation because the green samples here are beyond the range of my standards. Turns out diatoms have just tons of Rubisco. Clever things. This one, we pushed it right to the next level. We actually detected three proteins at the same time on the same blot. Our standards are gorgeous. The proteins, kind of, the samples look a little bit like shit, I'm afraid, but anyway. Some of them look wonderful. The problem here is that PSAC is a weak antibody. That's photosystem one. Um, so we can't actually see it very well in our samples. It's down here, the green band down here. But PSBA is showing up nicely in some of them. RBCL, of course, the most robust thing in the world, showing up well in, in most of those species. So you can uh, detect several things, same blot, same time, save money, hopefully because of time, although you do have to you know, purchase either labeled primaries or, um, or do a, purchase some fluorescently labeled secondaries. So just a little bit of the history for those of you who don't know, Agrocera is uh, an antibody production company that's been operating for about 25 years in northern Sweden. And um, about 10 years ago, they started doing a catalog of antibodies for sale, and they targeted the plant and photosynthesis market because that was the underserved market. If you want an antibody to any protein in humans or rats or mice, you can just buy it anywhere lots of options, but for plants and photosynthetic things, you're really limited. So this was the niche that they chose. Um, Environmental Produce, the company that I own, uh, is a, been around for six or eight years, and what, what our part of the, the deal is, is we design the peptides or make the recombinant pieces of protein to inject, and then we validate the antibodies once they're made to make sure they actually work and they actually detect the protein that you're expecting them to detect because not all antibodies are created equally, believe me. So that's our part of the, of the piece. And that now together we're growing our catalog. And one of the ways that we grow it is when customers come to us and say, gee, I wish you had an antibody for protein XYZ. If you have a question like that, please forward it to Joanna, looks like Joanna, at Agrocera. She'll put it on our list of antibodies to make. And that's the way we gauge what the market wants. So don't hesitate to ask for something you don't find in our catalog.